Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Uh, earnings season is rolling on when it comes to America's largest cannabis companies. We got the latest update last night from Green Thumb Industries reporting earnings uh, and revenue numbers that topped expectations up 134% year over year on its top line to surpass $177 million in revenue. Adjusted operating EBITDA also grew 23% uh, sequentially the top $65 million or 36.9% of revenue. So a lot to get in here too, as Wall Street upped their price targets. Piper Sandler upped their target to 40 bucks a share from 35. Cowan raised their price target to 45 bucks a share up from 30 bucks a share. So for more on all the optimism here, I wanna bring on the CEO of Green Thumb Industries, Ben Kobler joins us now. And Ben, I mean, when we look at it, there's a lot to talk about in the growth that you guys have been able to put up. Uh, but how much of that is stemming from opening up in new markets versus what you're seeing in store, what people are buying? Because you also uh, have quite a bit on the margin front to discuss. So talk to me about where you're seeing the growth. Yeah, thanks, Zach. It's great to be back. Uh, it was a great quarter and a great year. And if we step back, we, we see growth really all around. and We see leverage across the income statement. So for 2020, for Green Thumb, we did over $550 million in revenue. We had $180 million of EBITDA, positive net income and over 95 million of free cash flow. That's really what we look at as the free cash flow after tax uh, that we can then deploy back into the business. We're seeing growth uh, from American consumers choosing more cannabis. And that's in medical markets that are growing, that's in medical markets that are converting to adult use, or uh, that have, like Illinois on 1-1-2020, one as that market continues to grow. Um, and, and it's really pretty universal, and it's really sweeping across the country New Jersey, uh, which will offer adult use legalized cannabis soon, uh, is working itself out, but we had the election in November. So we're very excited about what's happening across the country. Yeah, you opened your first store in California, your second in New Jersey. That's another state we're watching as the legal sales through uh, existing stores there are expected to come across in about six months. But when you look at maybe the products themselves, an interesting partnership with you guys in Can to move into the cannabis beverage space, uh, talk to me about that growth and, and how that fits into maybe product form and what you're seeing the most growth of in cannabis. Sure, 100%. And you're right. We opened in Pasadena, California, and we opened in Paramus, New Jersey. Uh, in back-to-back -back weeks. Uh, and that's part of our business to be able to execute like that. And, and that sort of scale and that sort of visibility from where we sit all the way into the consumer to the point of sale, and like I mentioned uh, yesterday on the call, about four million transactions yesterday, gives us insight into the consumer, who they are, why they consume, when they consume, how they consume. And, and we can use that to make judgments on how we deploy capital, uh, for example, which markets we expand in, and then which brands make sense, who, where, why, and how that brand develops an honest relationship with the consumer. So you bring up CAN, this is in the beverage category, which is so far a small category in cannabis. We think it's, a, we know it's the leading cannabis beverage. <clears throat> Have it right here. Hi boy, great product, unbelievably great tasting. And this is an alternative to alcohol, this uh, to a drink. Th this is a product for a new entrant into the category. Somebody who may not be as familiar with cannabis, but is familiar with a glass of wine. And the, the upside with can is less calories and no hangover. Uh, and so we think it's a good entry. And how much better is it to take something that works in Pasadena and bring it to Paramus? Uh, and, and that's what we can really do from where we sit, because what our business is at the core is branded consumer products that are going to develop a relationship with the American consumer. Yeah, that, that's what's interesting to me, too. And by the way, I enjoy product placement. Always props to people who have it nearby and bring it on. Always enjoy that. But when we're looking at, you know, where these investments are going, it was interesting to see Cureleaf, uh, you know, not, uh, not too long ago, announced their plans to expand into Europe, which I wondered how much stemmed from kind of the sector's take on, on legalization right now, because it's taking a while. We did not get the Safe Banking Act like a lot of people were expecting. Reforms are taking longer. We're seeing political division in D.C. I mean, you seem to be leaning into uh, growth here in the U.S. So what's your timeline for when you expect to see reforms come through if you are going to keep investing in the U.S. market? Uh, you're right. <clears throat> Our investment thesis is not contingent on something happening in D.C., our investment thesis is contingent on the American consumer liking the product. If they like it, they're gonna buy it. Uh, we think the legal markets are only gonna grow as they bring tax dollars and jobs to those markets. There's momentum on SAFE this week. Uh, there's talk of it being introduced. Uh, that would be very positive for the industry. Certainly, SAFE banking 
exactly what it says would help the industry. Uh, th there's a nonsensical element of the cash transactions happening uh, that would be beneficial to remove. Um, but we are focused on the US. Right now, it's all you can eat. East of the Mississippi is a incredibly dynamic market. We think it's early innings, but the game has started, and you're in a decade of growth, 20% compounded annually, taking an industry from 20 billion to north of 80 billion. Yeah, and there, as you said, I mean, regardless of what happens at the federal level, there are a lot of states changing these. New York, uh, the latest one to be discussing it. But when you look at your cost of capital, that's another one that investors look to uh, as changing over the years. Now that you have this growth to show, uh, talk to me about sure. how much easier it's become as a, as a company now to maybe raise that capital versus before and how that industry wide is changing as you look to maybe invest in that growth. Yeah, great question, Zach. So cost of capital is the key. Uh, the, the winners over the cycles, we've talked about the rhyme of history, are those with the access to capital and then the lowest cost of capital. So I've talked about for a while how access to capital and cannabis has been limited and now the cost of capital is going down. So what we recently did at Green Thumb was sell US securities uh, registered with the SEC. We sold $156 million of stock recently. That's really the first time that this is starting to happen and we're starting to see large size US institutional bid into the space who are starting to understand the demand curve and how big the industry is going to be. It's really that core basic fact. In addition to raising equity, you're starting to see the cost of capital come down on the debt uh, and other metrics. And really, the, the short answer to all that speak is this is good for shareholders. This will create a lot of equity value because the investments that we can do into the business and into the market, and you name the state east of the Mississippi, and we can talk about why it's a, an interesting opportunity, uh, that that return on invested capital is very good. That's what creates shareholder returns. That's what creates free cash flow and EPS. Yeah, and a lot of people are focusing on what kind of tax reforms might come through at a federal level, but this is another piece I don't think gets talked enough, the cost of capital. But appreciate you weighing in on all that. Uh, ben Kovler, Green Thumb Industries founder and CEO. Appreciate you coming on here as always. Be well.